Great job. Praise God. Thank you for being here and leading us in worship. This morning we're going to be continuing our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Actually, we'll be finishing this chapter. It's been 40 verses, a very long chapter. So if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 14, we'll begin in a moment with verse 39. But uh, I'd like to say a couple of things first. You know we're in a study through 1 Corinthians. But in the midst of that study, because... 1 Corinthians has so much teaching about spiritual gifts, we're going to also go on and put in a complete study of spiritual gifts in this. So when we finish today, we're going to be moving to some other portions of Scripture like Romans 12 and Ephesians 4 and bring in other related verses of Scripture concerning the gifts. We will cover all of the gifts and then we will come back to chapter 15 and then seek to go through the rest of, of the chapter. So it's been uh, a long study in 1 Corinthians, but there's been some other things brought in. Uh, we brought a, quite a bit in concerning love in chapter 13, additional to just the verses. So one of these days, God willing, I promise you, we're going to finish this. But today, I would like to give a review of chapter 14. It's an important verse of Scripture. And one of the reasons it's so important is because it is misunderstood and misinterpreted and misused in a lot of different ways by a lot of different people. And I think it's really important for us to understand exactly what is being said in this verse of Scripture if we're going to uh, follow God in the way that He wants us to be followed concerning the gifts that are mentioned here uh, in these verses. So uh, let me give the review, and then I think that will help us as we look at the last two verses, 39 and 40. Paul began chapter 14 with the instructions for Christians to pursue God like love. And we saw that the Greek word for that was agape, a very special kind of love, different from any other kind. Uh, it's God's kind of love. And He told us that we're to pursue that. We're to go after that. Now in chapter 13, He made it clear that if our spiritual gifts are void of this God-like love, then it will profit us nothing to be using them. Therefore, we need to realize that the most important aspect then of our lives as Christians is to be found living out this God-like love in all aspects of our life. Because if we're not living out the Godlike love as a Christian, then all the other stuff we do is not going to account much for us or for anyone else. Now, this is truly a tall order for any Christian to live up to. And it can only be done as we uh, really live according to the Word of God and we live by the power of the Spirit of God. So, we saw those things and then he proceeded to give the Christians in Corinth and the Christians in our day some very important instructions concerning the use of the three gifts that he highlighted in chapter 14. And they were prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Now evidently, the Corinthian church was not using these three gifts in the way that they should have been. And so Paul gives this instruction and he's expecting them to bring their actions uh, under correction, bring it under uh, the leadership and teaching of what he was saying. And uh, we realize if we look around much today, these, these, uh, three, ver uh, these three gifts are not being used exactly as God uh, shows us in the Word today. So it's a, it's a, a valid word for uh, churches and Christians in our day. Now there are a lot of Christians and one of the ways that they misuse these verses and misuse uh, these gifts is that they say that these three gifts along with a couple of others ended at the end of the first century. They said they were real and God gave them and people operated in them but at a point in time at, with the dying off of the first century apostles that these gifts ended. And as I said, they will 
take prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues. They will put healing with that, uh, deliverance, and things of that nature. And they will come up with a situation that says, those gifts have ceased, yet the other gifts have continued. Well, <clears throat> I would just ask you to think about that in this way. Would the Spirit of God led the Apostle Paul to give 40 verses of Scripture instructing us how to properly use these three gifts if he knew and intended for them to become dead and insignificant and no longer in play for the next 1900 years of the church. And I think anyone that says that they're not <coughs> real and for the church today really has to wrestle with that question. <coughs> God just wouldn't have done that, I don't believe. Because so much time has been spent in chapter 20 speaking of those three gifts. I mean, chapter 14, speaking of those three gifts. Now, we learned also that every spiritual gift is intended to produce a desired result. And Paul showed us that the desired result of prophecy was to build up the church, the body of Christ. And... <clears throat> Prophecy is able to do this and bring this result about because as we learn, it is a now message and word from God that is given in the language or the vernacular of the people in the congregation. And therefore, they can receive this fresh word from God. Now, we pointed out that it does not become equal with the word of God and it is not added to the word of God. And it is not to be something contrary to the Word of God. Prophecy is a word, a fresh word from God, but it is going to be in agreement with the Word of God and not added to or considered a part of the canon of Scripture. But it is a vitally important gift. Now on the other hand, the gift of tongues does not come forth as the language of the people. Instead, it is an ecstatic utterance that is not understood by the speaker, nor is it understood by the hearer. Now, the exception to this in Scripture was Acts chapter 2, and there on the day of Pentecost, the disciples spoke in tongues, and the tongues they spoke in were known languages that they had not learned, but were the languages spoken by the people gathered there that God wanted the, the message to go forth and He enabled them to speak in languages they had not learned but languages that the, the people gathered there clearly understood. So we see that tongues then serves the purpose of building the speaker up spiritually. That's what we learned. That when a person prays in tongues in their prayer language of tongues they are built up spiritually. They don't understand what they're praying, but God understands. So, this has that power, uh, but it doesn't build up the hearer spiritually, simply because no one understands what's being said. So then believers are encouraged to pray in tongues privately between themselves and God so that they can be built up spiritually, and that happens because God understands the praying in tongues that's being prayed to Him. So, this is a real area of submission for a Christian. When you will allow yourself to pray in tongues to God, you don't know what you're praying. Only God knows. So you're really trusting the Holy Spirit and God to say, God... Not what I want for sure, but what you want. Because you're praying in a language He gives you that you don't have a clue what you're saying. And I've jokingly said this before. You know, a lot of Christians, when they become a Christian, a lot of people think, well, the first thing God's going to do is send me to Africa as a missionary. And uh, that seems to be a standing joke in the church and has been for decades. But the point is... <laughs> When you're praying in a prayer language to God in tongues, you may be saying, oh God, please send me to Africa. I mean, you... <laughs>
but God does. And it will be in accordance with His will and it will be uplifting and it will build you up spiritually as you do that. Now, the only time the gift of tongues is to be used publicly is when there is an interpreter present. When there is one with the gift of interpretation of tongues. When tongues is spoken publicly in the church and then when it is interpreted, then the hearers become able to understand the message and the message then becomes equal with prophecy because the message is given in the vernacular, in the language of the people that are present. So, the congregation hears, the congregation understands, and they receive this message from God, just like they do in the gift of prophecy. Now, Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit when he gave all of this teaching, and he gave these instructions concerning speaking in tongues. Uh, and a couple of those are simply this. You're to speak in tongues in a, publicly in a church service only when there is someone present to interpret. Second, he said that only three, at most, three are to speak in tongues in a church service. He also said that only three, at most, were to prophesy in a church service. And he clearly presented the fact that it was God's will for only one of these people to be speaking at the same time. So, not a whole bunch of people praying in tongues out loud with no interpretation. Not a whole bunch of people praying in tongues at the same time. Not a whole bunch of people standing up prophesying at the same time. At most three in any one service in, in tongues and prophecy. And the tongues must be interpreted. If it is not interpreted, then the person is told to be quiet and to pray between themselves and God silently without anyone else uh, knowing or hearing them pray in tongues. So this is very important because this is one of the areas that the gifts are misused in today. So churches that allow more than one person to speak in tongues at one time in a church service is, is conducting their services contrary to the will of God. They're conducting their services contrary to the express will of God in the Word of God. Now, churches that allow interpretation of tongues without, I mean, uh, allow uh, speaking in tongues publicly without interpretation are also going against the teachings of God. And that would come across as very harsh to, in some churches because some churches practice this all the time. And it presents a problem. And it is something that needs to be understood and it needs to be corrected because God is not going to bless that which is done in the church that is against His clear will in the Word of God. And why this goes on, I don't know. Because this is clear in chapter 14. I think it goes on simply because people are willing to follow their tradition the way they were raised more than they're willing to change their tradition to come into agreement with the Word of God. And the days that we live in is becoming more and more and more important for us as Christians to live by the Word. Not by the traditions of men. Not by our own ideas. Not by our own philosophies. But by the Word itself. Because uh, <clears throat> we're entering a time in which there's going the divide between the lost and the saved is going to get deeper and deeper and wider and wider. It, it's happening every day. Uh, most of you know just this last week or so uh, Idaho went to same-sex marriage I, I made the statement about six months ago within a year I believe all the states will go that way but you know in my mind and my heart I thought Idaho would be one of the very last that would hold out but because of one person 
as it has been in Colorado and other states. Um, they're falling just like dominoes. And uh, it's not going to be long if Jesus tarries that when a preacher stands up and preaches against homosexuality and same-sex marriage, they're going to be, begin to be arrested for hate speech. And uh, it's going to be, the time is going to come if Jesus leaves us here long enough that you and I will see Christians and, and people who are faithful to the Word of God <coughs> harassed, arrested, probably imprisoned, fined, no doubt, and all sorts of things for simply proclaiming the Word of God. And my thought about that is simply this. You know, if that's what God wants for me, then I can just start a whole new jail ministry, prison ministry. <laughs> I love I love doing the prison ministry when I did it for, for several years. And it will be better than when I did it before. Because I won't have to leave. I can just stay right there with them. <laughs> I asked them if I could do that. Uh, I felt like, you know, when I was going to the prison, I thought, you know, it would really be good if I could just spend 24 hours out here. Instead of coming and spending a few hours and leaving, I could really hang out with these guys and I could really know more how to identify with them, and, but they wouldn't let me. Wouldn't let me <laughs> but seriously, we, we do need to be grounded in the Word of God, whatever it is, whether it's the, the correct use of a spiritual gift or whatever it is. Then Paul dealt with the problem of women speaking in the church. Now, we, when we looked at that, we saw that there were several related verses of Scripture that showed us that in that day and time, women could pray and women could prophesy if they had their head covered or their head veiled. So, what he was referring to mainly by the speaking in tongues was, uh, he made it clear, was asking questions and just a lot of uh, chatter back and forth and disruption within the church service. And what we concluded from this was that the church that was in that day, in that society, it expected moral women to veil their heads and to remain quiet do not speak in public. And that was what was expected of women in that day. Now, that's not what is expected of women in our day. So the culture has changed, and this is something that I think is able to be changed in the fact that women can have uh, can use their gifts in church and that women do not have to be veiled in our day. Now let me say this. I believe that we can make that adjustment and it be acceptable to God, but I'm not saying that we're to have the culture dictate what we accept or enforce or reject and don't carry out in the Word of God. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a fine line. Because in this situation, we're not talking about something that is being done that is immoral or sinful or hazardous to the person that does it or hazardous to the church. But there are many things today that people are trying to say, well, this is not the 19th century anymore. That's old-fashioned. And therefore, we need to catch up with the culture, we need to catch up with what's going on in the world and allow these additional things to happen. And that's not what I'm saying. Because we could give a long list of things that we should realize just because the society is going against the Word of God here does not liberate the church to go against the Word of God. So please don't confuse dealing with the society of Paul's day and the, the situation of women speaking in church or not and the culture of our day. Don't confuse that with saying, well, we can just let the culture dictate anything that we want to and therefore we can be valid in changing scripture to meet our culture. I'm not trying to say that at all and, and I believe you understand the difference in that. Now, with this review, those of you that have not been with us, you, you got to hear something 
sort of a, a, a snapshot of all of these 40 verses. Those of you, you were not bored, but maybe taking this in the review the way we did all together maybe made some of it come clearer to you. I hope it did. But what I do believe for sure will happen is it's going to enable us by having this review to get the greatest benefit from looking at the last two verses as we close this chapter. Verses 39 and verse 40. So let's begin with verse 39. Ideally, these would have been connected with the last uh, message, but there just was not uh, an appropriate amount of time. And uh, there wasn't a natural break here, uh, but we had to break it anyway. So, verse 39. He says, Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak in tongues. So Paul begins with pursue prophecy, okay, pursue love, and then he's sort of closing with the same kind of thought concerning prophecy. Uh, Paul begins by saying, therefore, and that's important here because that means he's saying, because of all the previous things that I've said, because of what we have reviewed today, he's saying because of those things that have been said, then you should desire earnestly to prophesy. And then he says, and do not forbid to speak in tongues. And we made the point when we saw uh, talked about tongues earlier that there are churches and there are entire denominations today who forbid anyone to speak in tongues. Denomination that Belita and I spent some time in and I was actually uh, trained in for, for ministry, <clears throat> their uh, mission board uh, makes a person sign a statement to say they have never spoken in tongues and they will never speak in tongues if they're going to be appointed as a missionary uh, through that organization. And so you can see that that is totally contrary to the Word of God. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science the, the verse I just read. Earnestly desire prophecy and don't forbid to speak in tongues. Now, as far as prophecy is concerned, their take on prophecy is not that God could speak through someone in a fresh word today, presently, or through a prophet. The, their, their position is that those that gift is, has ended. And they would simply say that whenever a person preaches, they are filling the gift of a prophet. Well, I preach a lot. But I'm not a prophet. And preaching, a, a, a prophet can preach, but preaching is not the only way that the prophetic gift would show itself. So I think you see what I'm saying in this. There, there, there's just a lot of people that are not getting the word right concerning these areas, particularly of these three gifts. Now, of the two gifts, the believer must desire to operate in the gift of prophecy most, is sort of what he's saying here. Now why is that? Well, I think the answer has been clear in the study and it was clear in the review that I gave. Prophecy is a now word from God in the language of the people. Prophecy can stand alone and it can produce God's desired result. And that is spiritually building up the body of Christ. Why? Because when the gift of prophecy is used, there's no failure to understand what is being said. The prophet speaks a message from God in the language of the people. Therefore, it can immediately be used of God to build up the congregation spiritually. Now, at the same time, the gift of tongues, Paul is saying by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is a valid gift and Christians should not forbid the speaking in tongues. Now our review reveals certain requirements when tongues is to be spoken publicly. Now keep in mind that 
A person can have the prayer language and ability to speak to God in tongues. And that is done between themselves and God. They do not understand what they're saying, but God does. And when they use that ability, then it builds them up spiritually. But at the same time, there is a public speaking in tongues. Let me say it this way. Some people pray in tongues privately to God regularly. And that does not mean that they have the gift to speak publicly in tongues. Some people pray in tongues privately to God regularly and they have the public gift of speaking in tongues. I can't show you scripture for this, but from experience and hearing this from other people, I believe that if a person prays in tongues and they have the gift of public tongues, I believe that the tongues they pray in is the same tongues they speak in publicly. Now like I say, I can't give you a verse of scripture for that. But I believe that it is the experience that most people have. That it's not one language in tongues to pray and another language in public. Yet, everyone who has a prayer language is not expected to speak publicly with their prayer language. And I hope that's not confusing. Uh, I'm sure it's not confusing to God, but that's really the way it is. Uh, and, and we need to be uh, aware of that. Now, when tongues is spoken publicly in a congregation or in a service, there must be an interpreter present. And when I touched on this the other day, uh, up earlier in the verses, I left something out that I want to make mention of. And uh, you can go back and look at it and read it if you want to. And you can buy into this or not buy into this, whatever you'd like to do. But the way I saw that verse of Scripture was that when there is public tongue spoken, there must be an interpreter. And when a person commits themselves at the point of interpreting a message that has been spoken publicly in tongues in the church service, then that same person is to do the interpreting if anyone else speaks in tongues. Now I know some of you might disagree with that. But go back and read chapter 14 and study that part very clearly because it, it plainly puts it out that there's one person that's to do the interpreting. Now, that doesn't mean that in a church there's only one person that, all, that ever interprets. It simply means that if somebody speaks publicly, then whoever interprets that message will be the one if any other public tongues is spoken in that service that day. Now, the next Sunday it could be different. Somebody else might speak in tongues and someone else be the one that would interpret publicly or give the public interpretation. And then it would apply that they would be the only one who would give interpretation. And again, only at most three tongues would be spoken in any one given church service. And only only one at a time of those three would speak. There would be the tongue spoken, there would be the interpretation. If someone else had that gift and was led to use it that day, they would speak, and then the same person that interpreted the first would interpret the second. And then likewise, if, the, if a third person spoke, then the same person would interpret that. If somebody else starts to speak in tongues, they are out of order, and they should be silenced by whoever is in charge. Because a fourth speaking in tongues would be contrary to the will of God in that service. One at a time. And there must be interpretation. And this is the area that, that, that many people fall away from what the Scripture teaches uh, at, at that very point. Now, when these requirements are met, as we said before, this is important to realize, when these requirements are met, the gift of tongues in a public service, spoken in a public service, becomes 
equal and just as important and just as valuable to the building up of the entire okay that's another thing that's important for us to realize and keep in mind because a lot of people like to read chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians and they like to say that it's really a, a, a treatise on just tearing tongues down and showing how worthless it really is they say prophecy is encouraged tongues is tolerated that's not what this scripture is teaching it is simply talking about tongues and if it's not able to to build the body up then it should not be spoken in the church but when it's spoken and it has interpretation then it builds the body up and it's just as valid and just as important as prophecy so don't be caught up in something that somebody teaches on this verse this ch chapter in Corinthians and, and, and they slam tongues all the way through an interpretation of tongues when you see that you know that it's somebody saying I don't want tongues in my church service and I can't get around saying that it's not a valid gift but I'm going to say that 1 Corinthians 14 tears it down as much as possible and belittles it as much as possible. And that's not what the Scripture is doing here. Uh, it's just not. Now, let's look at verse 40 and we'll be closing. But all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. The Word of God is saying then in church, all things must be done properly and in order. We need to realize that God is not a, it, that God is a God of order, and He desires His children to worship Him decently and in order. Again, Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is seeking to bring serenity to the worship service. He's seeking to bring serenity and order to the worship service. But listen to this. But at the same time, he does not want to eliminate the vibrant, spontaneous joy and freedom that the Spirit desires to produce in worship. Let me say all that again. Paul is seeking to bring serenity and order in the worship of God. But at the same time, he does not want to eliminate the vibrant, spontaneous joy and freedom that the Spirit desires to produce. Therefore, a proper service should have a measure of, of, uh, of uh, freedom about it, but at the same time, it should also have a measure of order. Okay, So there should be some freedom but yet there should be some orderliness in worship. Enthusiastic freedom in worship must be allowed. Enthusiastic freedom in worship must be allowed. We can see this from Scripture. But it must not be allowed to move into disorderly emotional extravagance that results in confusion. Because God is not the author of confusion. So do you see what we're trying to say here? There needs to be a freedom in worship service. That the Spirit can move freely. But it must not deteriorate into something that becomes so emotionally extravagant that there's confusion. And one perfect example of that is when churches allow and encourage everybody that can speak in tongues to stand to their feet and begin to speak in tongues out loud all at the same time with absolutely no interpretation. That goes against the will of God in several ways. And it should not be allowed. But it happens all the time. And what is brought about from that is confusion. And I've shared this with you before, but I think it's important to, to hear again. There are people who are Christians today who before they were saved were in some type of a cult or some type of 
Satanist group. And they were sent into churches that allowed this to happen. And they were sent to go in there and when everybody else is speaking in tongues, they speak in demonic tongues. And in the process of what they're speaking, they're cursing the whole bunch. And they're standing there right along with everybody else and it's not revealed because there's no requirement of one to speak at a time and there must be interpretation. Because you see, if that plant stood up and spoke all by themselves aloud at one time, then number one, there would be people present with the gift of discernment that would know immediately that it was not from God, it was from the devil. And there would probably, probably be somebody there with the gift of interpretation that God would allow to interpret the demonic message. So you see, that could be avoided if the Word was followed. If the Word's not followed, that can continue and churches and individual Christians can be harmed. So I think that we've, we've covered this clearly. And uh, maybe some of you say we've covered it too clearly. But the Spirit of God led Paul to make a big emphasis on this. And therefore, I feel like and I felt like that it needed to be a big emphasis made on our part with it. That we understand it, that we get it right. And I know that the first time I went through some of this stuff, people were saying, well, I didn't understand that. And I could hear comments and questions being made realizing that just went right over people's heads. They didn't get that. So you've heard the saying, repetition is the mother of learning. I believe it's been repeated enough for those of you that are here that you understand what the Spirit of God is trying to say to the church in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, it would only be right for me as pastor to evaluate our own church services in the light of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And I have done that. And I can see that our church services have orderliness. And that's a good thing. But unfortunately, I don't see a lot of freedom. I believe that a major reason for that is what I'm fighting against this very minute. I'm two minutes past time. <laughs> for those of you that don't know, the bar is to open at 11, so we're supposed to be through. And so we are very restricted in time when we do anything that's just a little bit of an addition. I mean, I am fighting to save two and three minutes every Sunday. And in that restraint, there's no time for the freedom of the Spirit. And that's what I'm saying about the church that I, I recognize. Now, I think that God would have us do something to change that. I would ask you to pray along with me that He would lead us to know what to do to change that. Somebody could say, well, leave the bar and get your own place. And then you wouldn't have a time constraint. That's not the will of God for this church right now. Clearly, the, the, the will of God at this time, it could change in the future, is being in this bar having church on Sunday morning. So there must be another answer to this. And so I, I believe that we need to pray and we need to find out what God would say to us as to how that we can maintain the orderliness that's good, but also bring in that, that opportunity for the Spirit of God to bring a little more freedom into our worship services if He so desires. There might be somebody that is just receiving a, a, an important message from God for encouragement and exaltation and 
consolation like we saw that prophecy does that's needed to be heard there's no time for it with a message from God that is important for this congregation and not speaking because we don't have even a minute to spare so let's pray about that and let's see what God would have us to do so that we can we can become all that God wants us to be as a church that we could we could look at this chapter 14 and we could honestly say God we're seeking to allow our church service our worship service to follow the pattern and the teaching that is presented so clearly in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians now on one hand that's exciting on the other hand it makes me so frightened within myself personally the reason for that is simply this when more freedom comes in a service you always have the possibility of someone who is not going to conduct themselves by the leadership of the Spirit of God but they're going to conduct themselves out of their own flesh and ego and pride and desire to be seen and heard or as in the other illustration I gave you they may be conducting themselves by the power of a demonic spirit and that's why it's, I say it scares me within myself I'm not saying I'm scared I know God's bigger than all of that in that way but I just want you to know that even bringing this up is a big step for me because we've been here six years and we've never moved that far in churches believe and I've been in before we we had those gifts in operation but even then it was always always seeking to know is this of God is this of the flesh or is this of the devil and that's why God gives the gift of discernment and there's some of you here with that gift and your gift is going to be important in the days ahead as we if we do move into a, into a time that some of these gifts probably begin to operate in our services and you'll need to be able to stand firm on the use of your gift and simply let me know let somebody know or let the whole church know at the time that it happens that is not from God and we'll stop it because only that which is from God is what we want in this church service nothing not even a little tiny bit of something that is of the flesh or of the enemy so maybe that wasn't what you wanted to hear this morning <laughs> but it, it's what I, I I really feel that we have to do after taking so long and studying this verse of, this chapter of scripture we cannot be people who look at what the Word of God says and then stick our head in the sand and not take it seriously. Not try to bring ourselves in alignment with what it says. And right now, we're not in alignment with what it says. Bottom line. Okay? So, pray about this. I'll be taking this to the leadership and, and uh, we'll be praying about it and talking about it and hopefully... God will give us the, the proper answer. And more than anything, hopefully He will oversee every service so that there will never be a word spoken or a deed done in one of our services that is not 100% in accordance with the will of God. Now, this message does not lend itself to an evangelistic invitation, but I'm going to give one anyway since I'm over time anyway. Uh, sorry. Uh, that clock's not right in, up there, though. It's 10 minutes fast. Uh,
But if, if you're here today and you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, today would be a great day to do that. He's paid the price for your sins. He wants to forgive you. And this is the only means that that forgiveness can come is to just turn from that sin and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Our ministry team will be to my right to pray with you at the close of the service if that's your need. Also, if you have any other prayer needs, whatever they are, they will be there ready to pray for you. Our offering bucket is to my left. If you want to participate in the ministry of this church, drop in your tithes and offerings. If you can stay and eat and visit with us today, we want to encourage you to do that. And it's raining outside right now, so the, the ride will determine on the weather conditions. So at, at 12.30, it's not raining, and you want to ride, and, and Kevin and Julie want to ride, they're the leaders today, then we'll have a ride. Be patient. We've missed a lot of rides in May. But soon, very soon, it'll be 103 degrees and never <laughs> rain for three months. So we ride every Sunday afternoon. God bless you. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed.